Yeah, so in this talk, uh, we're going to talk about Selenium browsers, problem solutions, two frameworks, not three. We'll talk about what happens next, and we'll do a Q&A. Uh, uh, in this talk, we're not, I'm not going to convince you to delete and restart. I'm not getting paid commission. At least I don't think so. Um, we're going to skip over mobile. We're not going to talk about all the alternatives out there, and we're going to ignore Python and Java. So let's talk about in the beginning. So this is life after Selenium. Let's talk about in the beginning. In the beginning, there was Mercury. And Mercury created QTP. And that was created by Mercury Interactive in 1998. It was one of the first, if not the first, browser-based UI automation tool. It was closed source, proprietary, $4,000 per copy. And that was in 1998 dollars. Uh, I should say USD. Um, so that's probably more maybe almost double that. Um, and it had a limited browser support. It only, I believe, only worked with IE 3.0 or 1.0, um, and it only ran on Windows. Um, and so Selenium came from that. Selenium is the cure for mercury poisoning, and that was what the idea for, that's where the name comes from. It was created in the year 2004, long after that, and that it is now, in 2021, maintained by a Selenium HQ organization. It's open source and open standard. Um, cross, it, it was designed to be cross-browser instead of just working one place. They wanted to work everywhere. So they created the abstraction that we know today, which is WebDriver. So in today, in 2021, Selenium is the infrastructure and rule, the tooling to run WebDriver, but WebDriver is now the open standard. It's built into every browser now. It's part of the W3C specification. Any browser you're using today now has WebDriver built in. Um, and so therefore, it is cross-browser by definition. So what does that mean? <laughs> well, it's an open standard. So it's maintained, not necessarily maintained by the same folks. So while preparing for this talk today, my, and you've all probably seen this, um, my Chrome driver binary got out of sync with Chrome, um, in which it was out of sync with WebDriver and, you know, in the Selenium test itself. This is the problem with being an open standard. But, um, Let's talk about what WebDriver itself is driving. So um, the best way I know to do that is with a real world application. And so this is the Cypress real world app um, available on my GitHub repo. It's not created by me, it's built by the Cypress team, but everything we know and love is testers. It's got a login page. So, uh, you know, username, password, sign in button. Um, so this is Chrome. And on the right is the Chrome dev tools on the right with all of the network traffic that we're gonna capture here. So I've entered in the username, I've entered in the password, you click the sign in button. In my case, you can see here that we were successfully logged in, we got a successful request for login. Now I'm gonna to go to the new button up here and you can see what happens, right? When I got new, I got more information, more rendered on the screen. And when I start searching, I'm gonna search for Devon Becker. I'm searching and getting a payload back. So you can see here, this is the request that the browser is sending to the API server, which happens to be on localhost. And that is getting me a response of a JSON payload that is then simply uh, rendered on the screen. So again, you log in, you go to the new button, you wait for the new button to exist, and then you click on it. Then you wait for the search bar to exist you click on it and you enter in the string, Davon Becker, the web browser receives this JSON payload from the API and renders it on screen. And that's just like the simplest um, thing I can think to demonstrate Selenium. So let's talk about Selenium. So in a review, login page, authentication via an XHR API request, we're routed to home, we see the new button, we click on the new button and it's routed to um, a new URL. We, uh, the, um, the browser renders the search bar and then we search by firing off requests and receiving a payload. And that request is seen by the, um, the user. So I've got a Selenium test here that does just what we just did by hand. So we instantiate a browser. We, in our case, we were just doing a simple check to see that the name of the application is up. We are going to wait and we use the Selenium best practice for waiting and polling until this statement is true. So it's going to poll on internal implicit waiting 
um, for 10,000 milliseconds or 10 seconds. And we're waiting for the username field to exist. When it does exist, we move on into test logic. We send some uh, keys, the username, password, we click the button. And then we, um, then we click on the, the new button that we just saw at the top right. And then we're going to find the search bar. They're usually called Q for some reason, uh, query, I guess. And then we're gonna send the keys Davon Becker and assert that we've received Davon Becker text in the little dropdown. So this is a, a, a test. So again, if you wanna run this for yourself, please check out the, uh, the GitHub repo. So we've instantiated the browser. We've routed to localhost. We've seen the sign-in page. We've logged in and, uh-oh, we failed. And why have we failed? Well, in our case, there is no such element um, for the new button. And if you look at this, it's because we immediately went from the login page to the new button, but we have no idea from the Selenium standpoint what happens in between. And that's the problem. That's what we're here to talk about today. So why is Selenium flaky? It's because you're effectively stuck here um, in, your, in your test code. You don't really know what's going on um, between the web driver and the browser. Um, you have to pull until true and it's uh, stateless, it's restful, it's stateless. It, it becomes true, it's not event driven. And you have zero insight into what's going on between the browser and the web app with Selenium. So you're effectively, it's not event driven, it's polling versus listening for events there's this loose coupling because you're effectively stuck here at the web driver level or the, you know, your client library, in our case, JavaScript. And there's just generally a lack of observability here. So let's do that same exact test, but we're gonna add um, additional latency. In our case, something that's closer to the real world will add, you know, the difference between Jenkins and browser stack, for example, 100 milliseconds. So let's run that exact same test and what you'll see here is because we're polling until true, it continuously polls until this is available, polls until this is available on a given interval, and then it moves on and fails in the same way. It fails in exactly the same way, but we've, we've made it e the problem even worse by not running locally with local hosts. We've made it, um, the problem even worse by running like you would in Jenkins, which is a huge problem. So to summarize some of the problems, it's an open, which creates some dependencies without ownership, like you saw from the first failure message I showed you where Chrome driver couldn't talk to Chrome because it was the wrong version. Um, that's because it's an open standard. Um, you know, Chrome doesn't necessarily have to support every binary version of the web driver binary. There's abstraction. Um, so there's, because it runs everywhere, uh, that creates a problem, which is you are observing, you're stuck on the outside, which caused speed and performance issues. It's expensive to run because you're waiting, you're spending a lot of time, but also um, it's inherently flaky due to this loose coupling between the test code and what you actually are trying to test, which is the web application. So let's talk about the solutions here. So the solutions all come from what's happened in the web space. So in 2004, which is off the screen here, back here, um, Chrome didn't exist. Chrome didn't exist until about this portion here, and then it took off. And during that time, everything else kind of cratered. So the definition of what multi-browser means has changed. The definition of what, you know, going from IE um, to Chrome, that kind of has kind of shifted the entire landscape to what we're looking at today, which is Puppeteer. So Puppeteer is how the Chrome team tests Chrome. And that's hugely important because if you're going to test Chrome, you need a good interface. You can't have this lack of observability. So they created an API using that Chrome DevTools protocol that we looked at, which is the, you know, the, everything that you saw me do manually and you saw the network request come across is now exposed to your tests in, the, in, in Puppeteer. And um, to further, um, you know, uh, they've also made the API almost exactly match WebDriver in terms of the way that it looks and the way that it feels. So it, it's almost interchangeable in that sense, but it gives you everything you kind of need here. Um, also, it's evergreen. It always works. If you've got a version of Chrome installed, then you've got an associated Puppeteer binary that works. Um, it's easy to get you NPM installed Puppeteer. Um, it's now got multi-browser support. I remember that was a big deal for Selenium through the Nightlies and Firefox. Um, but I do want to call out 
it is not a framework, just a Selenium replacement. It's Puppeteer is not a framework. Um, it doesn't necessarily have assertions and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, so let's just spend one more slide on this to say Puppeteer is now event driven. The WebSocket interface is now provided instead of a stateless REST request interface, and you're getting everything you kind of need within the, it was, you know, kind of within uh, Chrome here. Um, and that it provides even more power than I think is immediately obvious that we're going to look at at the end here. Um, but you are now inside the browser and you're getting real time information streamed back to your tests about the application. And if you look at it head to head, effectively you've moved from here with WebDriver to here. You are inside the browser. You know everything there is to know about the web app. You know everything there is, your tests can know everything there is to know about what the web app is doing, which is where we want to be as testers. So a quick summary, uh, it's not a W3 standard. It's real time instead of polling. Uh, very few dependencies to manage. NPM install Puppeteer. Um, it's cross browser-ish, just Firefox now. It's not inherently flaky. Again, it's not that abstract because um, you're inside the browser and it's very lightweight. Very little that bring to bring with it. And that's a good thing. Um, and let's take a look at the best example I can say, the best example I know of, of the impact that CDP and Puppeteer have had is now that WebDriver IO, which was created in 2013, is now switched from WebDriver bindings to Puppeteer by default. It is so powerful that WebDriver IO needs a new domain name <laughs> because they, it's, you know, it's no longer appropriate to really call it WebDriver.io. Um, but let's take a look. Uh, it's it's an it's a open source framework, um, but let's just let's stop talking and take a look here. So I've got a WebDriver IO test looks very similar to the Selenium test we looked at. Um, you, you're, you know, you're waiting for the username to appear. Um, you are setting the values just like typing, uh, you know, typing keystrokes. You're clicking in exactly the same way. And all of this is using WebDriver under, under the hood. Um, you're waiting for it to exist and you're, you know, you're just following the standard thing. So um, here, we're, again, we're at the search where we set the value in the search bar, right? And then at the end of it, we are going to assert that Devon Becker appears in that search bar. So let's give it a shot. So I'm going to run this same test, but I'm going to use WebDriver IO and the WebDriver bindings that the framework provides. So boring, 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 but not so boring. It failed. And that it failed for the exact same reason that the Selenium test failed, which is it failed here. It doesn't necessarily know what has occurred between the search and it doesn't necessarily know what's occurred between um, and what's received and visible by the DOM in the for the client to see, the browser to see. Because this is still using the await mechanisms given by WebDriver. Um, you could use an anti-pattern, which is like putting in pauses, but that that's not really what we want. So let's, let's instead of that, let's give this a shot. Let's switch from WebDriver to Puppeteer, which is what's so cool about this is it's almost interchangeable if your framework supports it, which, uh, you know, this does here. So what's a little bit different here is remember, um, we, the test is the same until this point. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to intercept the network request search term for Davon Becker and guarantee that a 200 comes back from the API. And then we are going to move on only after this becomes true, only after this becomes true. And let's see what sort of effect that has on the, the outcome of the test. I'm going to save my, uh, I'm going to switch to the other one and save my changes. Um, and you'll see in the, the, the code base just how easy it is to switch between Puppeteer and WebDriver. So we're going to instantiate another browser, same thing, except now we're using CDP instead of WebDriver. Uh, bingo, and it's done. It worked. It did everything it needed to do because, um, and it did it as quickly as possible, basically real time, because of the, um, it has the information it needs to know when to transition between states, um, which is super cool, super powerful, um, and kind of, there's really no going back. Like once, once you're in the browser and you need, you have access to all the information you need, why go back? So um, unfortunately, we don't have enough time to demo Playwright today in this abbreviated version. I am going to talk about it, and I am going to show a screenshot from it. But just think about it as 
a, a problem. <laughs> uh, it's cross-browser testing done right. It's open source, but it's managed by Microsoft. Um, it's not using the same CDP interface exactly. It created a shim so that they could use other browsers. It's controversial though, and it best kind of illustrates what's happening in this space, which is Microsoft hired the puppeteer team. They just bought them. They, they poached them and moved them in. Um, and now we, you know, now you have Chrome, now, all right, now you have uh, Puppeteer and you have Playwright, um, but it's uh, causing issues because Playwright is using a fork of a fork of Firefox Puppeteer, but not the same one that Firefox is using now. So we, it, that makes your head spin. Yeah, it should. It's now very confusing. Um, and it's because of their shim that they've added here. It can run. Um, one cool thing is uh, one of the reasons they did this was so they could run on Safari, which is effectively, you know, WebKit, um, which means you can run, um, you know, your, your UI tests on Firefox, uh, Chrome, and now Safari effectively through WebKit. Um, and I'm going to give a picture of that, but effectively it's not a framework right now. It's a fork. Think of it more of a fork of Puppeteer. So if WebDriver.io wanted to, I think they could very easily change their, uh, their, their interface from the CDP um, puppeteer interface to the, um, the shim here. And I'm sure there's probably a package out there that does just that for folks that are using WebDriver IO tests, but want to run it with Playwright. And what does that give you? Well, really right now today, that gives you this, which is WebKit, the ability to run Safari tests anywhere. You can run it on a Jenkins Linux node. You can run it anywhere. You can cover Safari effectively, which is awesome. And unfortunately, we don't have time to demo it. But what I do want to take the time to demo is Cypress IO. So a little bit different, um, not using CDP directly. It kind of is, but it's proprietary. So we're going all the way back to the Mercury days. It's proprietary. Um, it's way more than a framework. It's kind of a holistic all-in-one solution to UI testing. You just NPM install Cypress um, and you have everything you need. They have a freemium OSS model that has um, a dashboard service that gives you test analytics and everything you would need to kind of complete the total feedback loop for tests. Um, it's cross-platform now, Firefox and Edge are now supported. Um, but otherwise, for most testers, um, it's gonna become clear kind of like where the power is with this tool here in a second in the demo. Let me go ahead and show you. So I'm going to show you the Cypress test. Mm -hmm. Hey, John, so just for the information, we test have here. five minutes left. Oh. Great. Awesome. So uh, thank you. So in here, um, we are going to um, do the same thing that we have been doing previously. Um, you can notice that it has built in waiting. It's waiting for this to be, be present before moving on. But it's all basically the same, except we ha now have access to this information. Um, we are going to wait for this to be true before moving on into the test. Very simple, um, very straightforward. Um, uh, yeah, let's just run it. So to run it, we're going to do npm run test Cypress open. And um, this is the headed version. Uh, you could run it headlessly if you'd like to, as if it were running in CI. Um, this is the GUI um, that comes with it. Um, I'm going to select the test I want to run. I'm going to run it against Canary. So let's run it. So what makes Cypress unique um, and differentiates it from the rest is what you're seeing on the left hand side. So right now the test that we looked at is running um, and it's identical to all the other tests that we saw previously. Um, it's, you know, entering the username, entering the password, clicking, waiting for this to exist and clicking on it. Um, and it's failing in the live demo, which is great. <laughs> let's run it again. Uh, um, let's try that one more time. Uh, right now, I don't know if you can see, but my computer is slowing to a crawl. Yeah. So unfortunately, um, this is exactly, but we can see exactly what's not working right now, um, that it is um, not exactly, this, this element is not exactly ready because the URL is not exactly correct. And you can see the XHR requests as they go across the wire. Um, so that's kind of, uh, kind of the power of Cypress is it gives you the insight of, you know, why did your test fail? Um, and you can see where it failed. You can get a snapshot in the DOM of what it saw when it failed. And in our case, this XH, this uh, link is actually bad. This link that we're looking for is actually bad because it's seeing two versions of that. So let's move on and pretend that didn't happen. Uh, it's a live demo. This is the way it goes. Um, and I'll figure out what went wrong after the 
after the demo. But let's let's do one step better and use Cypress 6.0 and take a look at what we can do as testers when we have access to everything in the browser. And in my case, I'm going to replace the payload that comes back from the API with my name and a first name and last name, which is pretty cool. I'm going to modify it on the wire. So let's do that. Yeah, that's also failing. Um, let's let me go ahead and do what we're not supposed to do, and let me go ahead and add a wait. I think it's just being bogged down by the fact that I'm presenting. So let's put a wait, which is the anti-pattern from Cyprus. Uh, let's go ahead and give it a shot. There it is. There it goes. And what you can see is um, you can see you have access to all of this information, so you can see everything as it comes across the wire. It's available in the test, and you can see I. I just took and I made up a payload, um, you know, real time in the test, which is awesome. And what that means is where we are now um, with Cypress 6.0 is we are here. We're actually on the other side of the web app. We're on both sides of it. We can modify it on the wire. We can, we can make the test be anything we want. So it's really powerful, for example, if you have an external service that you don't want to necessarily create all the time. You can mock it out, stub it out, or, you know, make the, you can make this test fail any number of ways. You know, every once in a while you need to test that a 500 error code is handled by the, the API. Well, here's your chance. You can do this however you want. Um, so in summary, uh, it's uh, real time without flake now. These All these solutions are fewer dependencies, less maintenance. They're all across browser, but they're open source with an issue that we're gonna talk about, which is kind of the future right now, which is where we are today with CDP. We've now gotten to a situation we've never been in, where we have multiple competing standards, multiple competing organizations, Microsoft, Google, Cypress, WebDriver IO, all kind of driving towards the same goal, but they're, they, we are no longer all happy with Selenium and WebDriver. Um, that is to say, until now. So uh, the one thing that I want to say is that Selenium 4 is out, um, or the beta is being released, you can see it here. It's using um, an open source W3C bi-directional CDP standard. That's where they're going. That's very new, should be happening in the next few weeks. So keep an eye on that um, and it's event-based. And effectively, yeah, we've gone kind of full circle here. And now Selenium um, is now right back to, you know, solving a lot of the problems that, that we talked about earlier. So I'm gonna uh, stop so I can leave some time for a Q&A, but in effect, we talked about Selenium. We identified some of the problems, walked through two of the solutions, and with Selenium 4, we kind of talked about what happens next with our bi-directional CDP uh, replacement interface.